Hello there and welcome to Inspire Me Forward. It's been a few weeks since we've done an episode and I am so excited to do this one, as I am all of them, but I'm really excited to do this one. Uh, my name is Linda Watson and I'm your host of this beautiful podcast and your founder as well. And we are on episode 31. Every time that goes up, I'm just so proud that we've been able to talk to so many people. And we really, Inspire Me Forward is about uh, sitting in virtual circle. Um, with our guests who bring their stories forward. And those stories are really about life, love, and everything that happens in between. And we just realized that by bringing together um, and sharing organically and sitting in this community, there's a seat at the table for everyone. Whether it's something like interesting today about dogs, whether it's something about horses, whether it's something about our panel coming up, which is um, the life of death, and if you're grieving, it, it's something for everyone, but not necessarily everything for everyone. So everybody finds something at some point in this. And I am just thrilled to have my guest today, Alyssa Giles, and we are talking about the support we offer our dogs. And Alyssa, I'm going to just give you a moment to introduce yourself. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate you having me on here. I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Alyssa Giles. I own Beyond Behavior, and I live in Davis County, Utah. Um, I grew up in Utah for the most part, most of my life in Utah. So um, I work with dogs, and I love animals in general. I love people, and I've kind of had the opportunity to get to combine those two things together, and I'm excited to talk about how that came about. Awesome. Well, I am too. Our pre-discussion was like two hours, which... I always say if I could talk to somebody for two hours, we're in. Like that's a that's a <laughs> litmus, litmus test for me is just like, yeah, we can if we can talk that long. There's something there to talk about. So so we're talking about the support, um, the support we we offer our dogs today. So we're not talking about training. We're talking about support. Uh, and I did a little just Googling on the before we came here. And and it's I think it's so important that in the States it was 65 plus million households have dogs as pets and you know in canada i know it's 2002 so it's going to be more but yeah, over half house half the households in canada have a dog as a pet so yeah. it's just it's 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 they're family members they are and we hear often Absolutely. hear of ownership and and all that and i work you know my life is with horses and we hear of ownership but at what point do we consider them, as some countries have, as, as sentient beings. They're part of the family. And I think this is so important that we offer them the same support we do our children. Yes, And absolutely. you and I really got into it. We're both, my kids are grown, but we both have <laughs> uh, children. And there was so much correlation there that uh, I just found it fascinating that that there is that correlation, that uh, that how we treat a loved one. And exactly. our dogs are our loved ones. And you are the mom of how many dogs? I have five girls and at the moment, two dogs. <laughs> okay, excellent. So two kids and two dogs. My kids are grown <laughs> up now. So um, yeah, that was so I, I, I start. we started, uh, Alyssa and I started talking before I came. I just had to take my dogs out for a quick pee before we, <laughs> before we started here. And, uh, you know, it was, they just showed me everything in a, in a five minute walk it was one wanted to play with the neighbor but she was barking and of course we think of barking as wanting to stop but I suddenly realized she was playing and she was bouncing with her front feet and just having that she was playing with him and and he always plays back and it was beautiful to see and my other dog wanted to lie down and roll but she wanted me to sort of reach down and scratch her belly uh, and I was part of me was in a hurry part of me was in this hurry oh I gotta get back we've got we're gonna talk and I had to send Alyssa a note that I'm going to be a few minutes late. And I just said, I just relaxed. And of course, as soon as I did, they did their, what they needed to do. And we came back, but it was just this beautiful reminder of supporting them in those moments and not being frustrated. And yeah. And being oh, mindful and present, right? Yeah, we exactly. forget that in this day and age, we're so rushed through. I've got this thing. There's always something new we need to be doing, right? We're always busy. There's always the next thing. And with our kids, with our partners, with our dogs in our lives, we tend to be always worrying about the future. What do I need to be doing next? Oh my gosh, I need to be getting to my next thing. And we tend to either miss or rush through those moments like that. And when we do get that chance to really 
connect and just let those things go and just connect and be present with our dogs or whoever we have, um, then we get that opportunity to, to bond and to get to know them a little bit better, right? You, you just learn something about your, your dog about, exactly. oh, this is play behavior. Exactly. Yeah. I got to have that moment of being present and learning something and getting to know them better. Yeah. And at the same time, learning something about myself. Yeah. Which is, that's true. Yeah, which, yeah, which we can always grow <laughs> and we can always evolve. So if that's as hard uh, as it is, it's good like, for oh us. Oh my right? goodness. Absolutely. <laughs> So before we sort of get it, before we get into it, we've already gotten into it, <laughs> but um, I'd love, I start all of our podcasts with um, a question and that is, can you tell me about a time that you were the receiver of an act of kindness? It can be random or not. Um, it doesn't have to be a re reciprocity. It just, tell me about a time. This was a hard one for me to answer in that I was a single mom for a period of time and I had so many acts of kindness during that time. The community and my family really, you know, came together and helped take care of me and my little one. And so it was hard for me to kind of pick from all of that because that whole period felt like just acts of kindness one after the other. Um, my dad, my parents ended up letting me stay with them for probably about a year while I was trying to find a good job that would support me and my daughter. And um, during that time, my dad, I had like $1,100, I think. I was like, dad, can you help me purchase a car that's not a lemon? You know, help me find someone that's not trying to sell me something bad. And instead, he took me to the dealership and bought me a car. <laughs> and it's like, you just pay me when you can, you know. So I had a, a good car, you know, instead of a $1,100 lemon um, that he he offered that to me. And um, you know, the, the idea was, yeah, I'll maybe pay him back when I, you know, have the money, but as, as I have the time and 10 years later, I had the money all finally paid wow. him off, but that was, you know, I got to save off on having to have a loan and having to pay off a, you know, expensive mm -hmm. car, but also not having to deal with a car that was, you know, going to die on me any second. So that was, that was a huge thing for me at that time to be able to have that transportation, that freedom and be able to pick up and get my life moving forward. So there was just a lot that went on during that period of time, yeah. but that's the one that stands out to me because yeah, it made such lovely. a huge yeah. difference in so many parts of my life at that time. So thank you for sharing that. It, it, cars are funny things. I just, when you say that, I'm like, yep. I gave my son a car, my daughter, my daughter still helped with the loan. I have, you know, like there's a bit, a lot of, you go back on that, but yes. that's, isn't that interesting? Cause that's in the world we live in. That's what gets us. That's what keeps us safe. That's what gets us from point A to point B gets us to our job to support our family. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. So let's get into this. Um, where to start? Why don't you tell us about how you got sort of, into this whole thing and i mean we, we, we when we talked before this we call it effective dog behavior but yes yeah share with us how you so were you all how i got here were, yeah how you got and <laughs> sure, how we got to be absolutely. here yeah yeah so i i went to college um and ended up um studying psychology that was what ended up catching my interest but specifically behaviorism right and so I got my degree in behaviorism and went straight from there and went I want to train dogs right and so I went into the dog training world from there and that was 15 plus years ago mm -hmm. and in the process of doing that and starting that business and going that direction a few years later is when I had my daughter and in preparation for being a mom, I had done so much parenting research, um, diving into not just parenting advice, but the research behind it. And I started going, you know, I'm told so often that dogs are like little kids, but what I'm reading is not what I'm seeing in terms of what I'm reading and how we're, what the research says about raising kids and helping kids is very different from what I'm doing with dogs right now and so I started looking around for does anybody do anything like this does anybody follow the neuroscience does anybody know you know mm -hmm. follow the emotional side of things and um that's when I came across uh, Scott Stoffer with the effective dog behavior and found out they have a certification program and everything I'm like this it really it filled us filled a hole you know I, I was floating around like there's just this empty there's a disconnect somewhere and that that connected for me so i i started 
going through that program and studying the the information there. And so it was really my parenting mm -hmm. philosophy that kind of switched me over in the dog training mm -hmm. end of things and had me start start to look at a different perspective in terms of how I was relating to dogs and how I was working with dogs. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where like I'm that, at now. That was four yeah. or five years ago when I, when I yeah. connected with effective dog behavior and have been doing yeah. things that way since then. So, yeah. So with that, and it, I'm going to be a psychology background myself. So I like to go down the rabbit hole many times. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, let's, well, let's talk about the science. Okay. Let's just talk about the science of their, um, let's start with stress. Like So, yeah, absolutely. And, and what we often, you know, the, 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 the brain is, is there to protect us, right? The brain is there to keep us safe and to help us through life. And so sometimes we, because a feeling is unpleasant, we jump to, oh, I want to make it go away. And especially if we've had any negative experiences, we want to save our kids or our dogs from that. We see our dogs or our kids upset and we want to save them from it. And, you know, unfortunately that results sometimes in, in kids or dogs that don't learn how to get through those big feelings and those unpleasant feelings because they're being rescued from them. And that's not to say that we go out of our way to stress or, or mm -hmm. make things unpleasant for our animals or for our kids, but when there's a situation that we can't really control or they can't really control what, what the neuroscience has found is that having somebody there to kind of support you and back you up, that's what protects us from trauma, mm -hmm. from PTSD. Um, and so that's kind of the perspective I've taken with, with dogs is it's, you know, obviously if it's too overwhelming, we're going to let the dog choose to get out of there. But if it's a situation where all the dog wants is to kind of like get an idea of what's happening and they just need us to back them up and be there with them, then it's okay for them to go through that stress with you there to okay. comfort them, to let them know they're safe, to, you know, let them communicate to you what they need in that moment. And sometimes that's to walk away, but sometimes it's just, Hey, can you cuddle me close for a second while I wait for this dog to walk past? Right. Mm -hmm. And so we don't necessarily want to avoid stress. Stress can be good. Um, but it's that resiliency is what we want to build. Um, help our dogs to get through the stress in a safe way where they feel emotionally safe. They know they're protected physically and emotionally by their, their caretaker and then they move through that stress and on the other end, they go, wow, that wasn't so bad. I mm -hmm. think I can do this. And now you have that confidence, you have that resilience. And so next time they start feeling better and better about the world. Mm -hmm. um, so the world is no longer a scary place. Now the world is, yes, scary things can happen, but overall things are safe. Overall, mm -hmm. I am safe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I develop that feeling of that internal feeling of safety rather than it. It starts out, you know, with kids, yeah. it starts out as an external thing. You know, you have the external um, co-regulation, right? But over time, it turns into self-regulation as they're able to internalize that I am safe. Mm -hmm. The world is safe. And therefore, I'm I'm able to regulate sure. myself, and I no longer necessarily always need somebody else to co-regulate with me. But we're social animals, so you know, co-regulation is always a nice thing. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's it's uh, so I, I go back to, and I will here just because this is my reference point or my frame of view here is I go back to our dogs. We've taught um, we've taught them the word middle. So mm -hmm. if they're overwhelmed, they can come in. They come in between our legs. And that's a, a safe place. We will protect them yes. there. So, and it's interesting to watch them over the years. I mean, we started doing it because of city, you know, sometimes city living. It was a place where we could have them between our legs. Traffic was going along. We had them yes. in a safe spot. But as the years go on, we're, that's their safe place. They know we're going to protect them there. They know they have a closeness to us there. And yes. yeah, we'll find them out playing with other dogs. But then you could see one of them sort of building up and they come and they've had enough and they come into that space. And that's I love that. So it's yes. yeah. So it's this idea, what can we do to give them like that's our thing that we've done. But what are you know, what are some of the things that we can do to help them self-regulate yes. and give them that protection? And what are the cues that we notice 
from our dogs early on when they're saying they're uncomfortable. Like you say, you notice when they're getting uncomfortable, you know, sometimes those signs of discomfort in dogs are so subtle, Mm -hmm. you know, some dogs have very, very subtle ways or they don't show it very well at all because they, you know, maybe in past history, they've learned that there isn't safety. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've got to protect myself, but yeah, looking out for those cues that, oh, they're uncomfortable and, you know, doing something like you say, going to them, having them come to you. And once they learn that that's an option, then instead of reacting, instead of fighting, instead of lunging, Mm -hmm. they turn and they go to mom and dad because they know there's safety there and they don't have to be defensive. They don't have to be protective. They can turn and go find their protection and get that safety. Yeah. And often they will, like you said before, I find often they will stay there for a bit and then go off again. Yes. There's something in parenting called the the circle of safety where it's kind of a diagram, right? And you've got your parent here and you've got like the playground and children and things over here. And so you've got the child is here with parent, right? Parent is kind of home base. And then they go out and play and then maybe something uncomfortable happens and they come back and parent is safety, right? And so it's the circle of safety. I feel confident. So I go out. Oops, I feel uncomfortable. I come back in Mm -hmm. and now I feel confident again. So I go back out again. And neuroscientifically what's happening there is you have, um, again, the oxytocin, that builds confidence. And so when you're with the person that you love and care about, feel safe with that oxytocin builds up as do the warm, fuzzy opioids, right. That make us feel warm and fuzzy and wonderful. And so when those hit an ideal range, then we feel confident and safe enough to go explore. But when we stay far enough away from our safe point for long enough, those opioids drop, right. And our oxytocin drops. We start feeling less confident, less warm, fuzzy, less Mm -hmm. safe. And so if something bad happens, even if something bad doesn't happen, but if something bad happens, now we can go back to that safe place and top up, right? On those yeah. those opioids, that oxytocin, get ourselves feeling confident, safe again. So there is that cycle of nice. I'm with mom, dad, I feel good. Yeah. I'm going to go explore for a little bit. Oh, now I'm feeling a little uncertain. Yeah. So I'm going to come back again and top up on those things. So Excellent. I see that a lot with with kids and dogs kids but and you dogs, see yeah. that yeah yeah and you see that with kids at the playground right you have those kids that are out playing and then they'll just randomly come and go hug mom right they're not there was no yeah, particular yeah. reason for it it's just i wanted a hug and then they go back out it. and feel yeah. feel good again yeah exactly yeah. and our dogs bid have make bids for that all the time yeah. um where they just come and they just get close to you right they come oh, yeah. into your presence and wait like yeah. are you gonna pet me i'd love a pet you know yeah. just because just because i need a little topping up of my opioids and then i'll go back out and do my thing but if we wait too long then those behaviors become bigger and okay, bigger yeah. and bigger until now you have a dog that's scratching and pawing and barking and you know doing crazy that's things fine. to get the the topping up on those opioids and so watching out for those little bids those subtle little bids for attention that may be very very quiet it might be as small as just being in your presence approaching you and looking you in the eyes you know well yeah making that eye contact which also releases those warm fuzzies and that oxytocin so and that's it's so that perfectly leads into what we were talking about before we came on here was another thing we've taught our dogs is look at me yeah to, to to look at us and it's been i don't think we even knew how how not useful for all of us that was when we did it or we started it but oh my goodness so these micro expressions that we get and you know we'll have them look at us and then look to something and look up they haven't even moved their head and yes and they're telling us something like what's yeah. my like we've got two so it's like you know looking at us and then going looking at her you know one of the look at her sister going you know what the heck is she doing now you know it's like <laughs> she's over yeah. there she's over there look what she, yeah look Mom, what check she's it doing. out yeah exactly <laughs> so I guess that like, ties into what you were saying with that you know and you were saying earlier it's like this world that we live in that we're on our phone and I so often see people walking their dogs on the phone and we're missing those micro expressions so maybe we yes. can talk a bit about you say absolutely little expressions yeah and i see this like you say with walks i love that you brought up walks we behave a lot of times very differently on our walks than we do in our home 
because in our mind, there's this, I need to get this done. I need to get us to a certain distance or a certain amount of time or whatever. And so we have this pressure. I need to finish this walk. I need to do this walk. And, um, and then on top of that, you know, sometimes being distracted by phones or by, you know, music in our ears or whatever. And we're kind of, kind of disconnected from our dogs. Right. And what I've seen happens is our dogs start to learn that, well, if you're not available for me, then I guess I'm on my own. And then you start seeing those problem behaviors where the dogs are, again, getting defensive, getting protective of themselves because they feel disconnected. Their opioids are low. Their oxytocin is low. They're not feeling great, but their dopamine is high, right? And so they're energetic, but they're energetic to try and meet a need, but you're not available to meet that need because of all the distractions and all the pressure of getting things done. And so they're meeting the need in different ways. They're getting it out of their system in different ways with the lunging and the barking or the pulling on the leash. Um, all these behaviors are that dopamine pushing them to meet a need that can't be met through you. Mm -hmm. And so they're meeting it through different other sure. options. Um, and so if we have take that time to you know what let's not pressure on ourselves to get a certain amount of distance or a certain amount of time done on this walk because what really fulfills our dogs is the connection the amount of time on the walk may not matter as much as how much you're interacting with your dog whether you're stopping and rubbing their belly you know letting them roll around in the grass and enjoying that with them not just watching them going okay buddy go sniff and have fun you're checking it out with them what did you find you found a pine cone i, did, I do not lie down on, on that you know <laughs> yeah, no 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 yeah for sure but just just being there and going oh you look like you're having some fun uh, you know let me yeah. tickle your belly you know doing something where you're engaged a little bit and connecting a little bit in that moment can be so fulfilling for our dogs that we might not need more than a 10 minute walk before they're just like okay I'm good now you know I've had a little bit of sniffs I had my fun time with mom and dad and now I can go and chill on the couch again at home so yeah making those connections throughout the walk and that means sometimes we're not walking sometimes we're letting them roll in the grass sometimes we're mm -hmm. sitting in the grass watching the sunset yeah. you know that might not necessarily be constant walking if you're yeah. the kind of person that likes to to jog and have your exercise in the evening and maybe you know, it's okay to let your dog stay home for a little minute while you get your exercise done. So you don't feel that pressure of, I have to get this going and, you know, ignore mm -hmm. my dog's maybe need that might have in that moment and push through and then come back yeah. again. But instead, you know, it's okay to have your needs met, but maybe you know, take your yeah. dog on a different walk. That's their needs. And you got two of you can connect in his way, you know, in the ways that he's, he's looking for. But we, um, see, we tend to see walks as only exercise yes yeah so to the point where we yeah. focus so much on that physical aspect but dogs want to they want to connect with us they want to stay connected with us just like our kids do mm -hmm. i mean imagine a walk with a toddler where we're like hey we got to just get there and come back again <laughs> that's not going to happen <laughs> yeah they want my husband just and, yeah yeah my husband just walked our daughter to daycare on her little balance bike and it was no you need to push me daddy you know yeah. so you know, they want that connection. They want that interaction. And um, of course they need physical exercise sure. up to a point, but they want it with us, not side by side, but mm -hmm. they want it emotionally yeah. connected with us. Interesting. Interesting. So much to think about. Um, why don't we talk about um We talked about support. Um, talk about their happiness. Let's jump about that. Like it's just yeah. So going back a little bit, you know, when that, we really. talked, yeah, exactly. And what happiness is is often, again, we often like to see. We're very trained, I think, as humans to look for big behavior, not just okay. in dogs, but just in general, right? Um, part of that's because our lives are so busy that it's, you know, we might be so distracted that it's not till something big happens that we mm -hmm. notice or or act Um because there's just so much going on in our lives. There's so much pulling at our attention. It's mm. like, I got to wait for the big thing before I act, because otherwise I'm pulled in 5,000 different directions. Sure. Yeah. And I think sometimes that applies with our dogs, or we sometimes don't notice until you start getting those big behaviors. And that translates, I think, to the happiness end of it, too. We don't think our dogs are happy unless they're big behavior. I'm goofy. I'm jumping up. I'm excited. And 
we forget that contentment is happiness too, right? And I see a lot of dogs that, and I imagine this happens with kids too, where again, we overstimulate them thinking, I need to keep them occupied. I need to have, take them to the park every Saturday and make sure that they're going to these museums and, you know, we're filling their lives with these interesting, fun, stimulating things. And we don't have a lot of time when we're just content with our kids, where we're just chilling with our kids, where they're just relaxing um, because we feel like we need to fill every moment of their day with something stimulating and exciting and new and different so they can have good experiences and unique experiences. And again, I think that kind of translates with our dogs where it's like, mm -hmm. he's not happy if he's not bouncing, if he's bouncing. not having the zoomies, right? But our dog that's chilling on the couch next to us while we watch oh. TV, he's happy, you know? He's cuddled with his favorite person and taking a snooze. I would love to cuddle with my favorite person and take a snooze all day, you know? That sounds amazing. They're perfectly happy to mm -hmm. be relaxed. They're perfectly happy to be quote unquote bored, right? Cool. It's okay to not hype your dog up a lot and it's okay mm. to want to calm your dog down you know some people yeah. are like well my dog's so happy but he's such a spaz it's okay to help him calm down yeah, absolutely he, yeah. he'll be happy with that too he just wants you <laughs> but i think so, a lot of that is we need to learn to calm down yes and that yeah, leads me into absolutely. sort of my next thing is what about not what about what about us like how can we learn we learn some for me I learned so much about myself in the interactions outside and inside. So, you know, even talk, you talked about, you know, lying on the couch with the dogs and you know, we're petting them and there's, there's, there's a endorphin release yes. with that that calms us. It is a, it is co-regulation. Yeah. And when I say co-regulation, we often talk about in, that in terms of parent child where, oh, the parents helping the child regulate it's going both ways. Yeah. And we sometimes, I think we forget that our dogs, like, <laughs> it's kind of funny on a, on a bigger basis, we go, oh yeah, dogs help us. Right. And we say it and we talk about it. Dogs help us. Dogs make us feel better. But I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of forget that. We forget mm -hmm. that when I'm frustrated, I can go to my dog. Mm -hmm. My dog will come to me and come and lay his head on my leg, you know, to try and help me help co-regulate oh, me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think if we could look at dogs as much as I talk about dogs as kids, because they are dependents, right? Yeah. They do rely on us for their needs to be met. But I think we need to be reminded that dogs are also wise. Yeah. Dogs are full beings with mm. intelligence and with That's instincts right. and with that ability to recognize what their needs are and how they need their needs met and their ability to recognize how to help you with your needs mm -hmm. and support you as a friend. I think there's so much we could learn about Love being that. human, right? Yeah. From our dogs, because they're so in the moment. They're like, Oh man, you're having a bad day. I'm here for you. I'm not going to try and fix it. I'm not going to try and tell you that your feelings aren't valid or that they should go away or that it'll get better. And, yep. you know, I'll just, I'll just sit with you. And you just cuddle with me and I'll be here for you. Yeah. Right. We could learn so much from about ourselves and about being a human from our dogs because they know how to be the most present friend, the most non-judgmental friend. And if we could flip that around because we're so cognitive, we get cool. so in the mindset of I need to fix my dog or I need to change my dog. I need to help my dog. Yes, yeah. we want to help our dog. Of course, that's the goal. Um, but how can we do it in a way that helps them feel heard and accepted in the moment yeah. not like oh you're not a good enough dog like even you know sometimes the phrasing we use with each other right is sometimes to some people can feel a little bit dismissive of of their feelings and so it's like okay in this moment what's what will help my dog feel heard and feel the most a part of the family and the most yeah wanted right yeah, yeah and so i think that's one thing we can really learn from our dogs and we'll really learn about ourselves in interacting with our dogs is my dog interacts with me in, in this way and it makes me feel good how can i do that in return yeah how can yeah. i flip that around and be more present in a way that helps my dog feel validated and loved and wanted yeah absolutely absolutely yeah
I used to, they're so empathetic. Yes. And, and, or, or I find them also um, very, um, they pick up on energy. I know one yeah. of ours that somebody will be sitting, um, sitting on a bench crying and she'll go over and put her head on their lap. And you're like, well, how did you even, how did you even know that? And there's been times I've been going to go to pick her for a walk and she's literally dragged me into the house and turns out there was a dog coming past that probably wasn't a good dog to meet. And that's yeah. an amazing, yeah, that's an amazing insight too, for you to be, you know, recognizing, oh, there was a reason for this, you know, this unusual behavior. He's not just being a bad dog. No. You know, there's a reason for this, this unusual behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how can we as humans and dogs together, but as humans, I think to supporting our dogs in that regulation. So again, when I go back to the, when these guys were younger, um, just sitting with them or sit, having them sit on the side of the road and using my voice and just the word calm and taking yeah. a long breath. So I knew I was calming down and just teaching the word calm. Yeah. And the, You're the, regulating yourself as well. Yeah. yeah. And they learn, Oh, okay. When we, we sit down and then after you and I talked last, um, one of them was being a little reactive with other dogs. One wanted to play one sort of a monkey see monkey do. So whatever she does, she does. <laughs> and you know, I, I took what you said to heart and whenever I, they're fine if another dog's not reactive, but they pick up on the energy. Yes. So, so I know some people are like, well, my dog's scary. This. Yeah. yeah. This dog is fine with this dog, but not with this, because that dog's, you know, presenting a threat or presenting yes. energy. But exactly. We, I got down with her and told her she was a good girl, supported her. And honestly, within a day or two, we walk past other reactive dogs now. She wow. sits and waits for them to go past. And it was the support that I wasn't giving yes. her. It, and people would say, but you can't reward the barking. But by the time they get to that big, big feeling and that big behavior, it's kind of too late to be like teaching a thing. At that point, it's yeah. just management. Like you're feeling big feelings. Let's help you with those big feelings. And next time let's watch out for those big feelings and help you feel better before they get too big. Right. But sometimes we have to look past that reward consequence and go, but there's a need behind this. Mm -hmm. And if I meet that need, maybe next time they'll go, Oh, she met the need. I'll turn to her instead. Oh yeah. And maybe that will help with the behavior. And so, yeah, if, if we're too focused on the outward behavior and not, recognizing the needs and the emotions behind it and how we would want to be responded to in that moment right yeah. then sometimes we get caught in the cycle of oh i can't help my dog right even though the deep down i want i feel bad that my dog's sad and upset and angry yeah. i feel bad and i want to help him but we're told we can't we're not supposed to reward that behavior and so we yeah. hold back and our parenting instinct you know our, our our caring instinct wants so bad to reach out and help our dog. And I, I that's one message I want to tell, tell people is it's, it's okay to, it's okay to help your dog. Yeah, Even if it's it was... a behavior that's driving you nuts, you know, if you're feeling that gut instinct of my dog needs help and I'm going to go to my dog, go to your dog. Yeah, yeah, It's okay to go with your instincts and go with your gut to care for your dog. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's a huge difference, huge difference. And just, reaching down and she's looking at us more she's looking up more she's look at the, so this and i'll i want to get into this is that seeking is like yeah i, I need you now i need you now yeah and or did i do well like even and the even, fact that you're yeah and the fact that you're recognizing that and you're seeing that she's doing that and so you're able to respond and now there's going to be even more back and forth responsiveness to the point where you yeah. know, it's just going to get better and better and better because you're getting an increase of connection between the two of you and seeking connection between yeah. the two of you. But I'm I so happy say, to I've hear done that. Any training? I, you know, yeah, it, I have. It, I've just had that. I've just changed the connection. Exactly. I've just you changed, changed how you're responding in that situation, and mm. now she's learning. Oh, mom's oh, got my back. Yeah. I don't have to defend myself anymore. Mom's got my back. Mom's going to help me feel better, reduce those stress chemicals, right? Increase those happy chemicals. And the, the, 
the cortisol, mm. the adrenaline, you know, the things that build up the stress chemicals, right? When something yeah. stressful is happening, those things, sometimes you have to play it away, right? You got to do a little bit of, let's push you around. Let's wrestle a little, a little bit. Yeah. Let's do something let's physical, right? Around, Cause you yeah. got to use it. You got to burn those chemicals off sure. or they need to pee it, pee it out. Right. <laughs> One or the other, you'll probably see a lot of peeing after a stressful incident. Sure. Um, but using it in that way, sometimes that that's, we talk a little bit quite a bit about play as well as play the stress away is, is how it's used in parenting play the stress away mm. and that goes for you too like yeah. if you're a, a dog parent who's stressed stressed out by your dog's behavior um we're often told no you need to be positive you need to be nice always be nice to your dog but parenting rage is a thing you're yeah. frustrated you're angry yeah. that's that's valid like yeah. what they're doing is hard for you and yeah. triggering for you and so the way you can get that out of your system without scaring your dog or hurting your dog is through play. That's what part of one of the functions of free play is, is to get our body moving, to get that stress out of our body in a way that's friendly, in a way that's um, recognized as playful. So it doesn't scare our dogs. Yeah. So I remember one TikToker or somebody, I can't remember, it was a short I saw where she said she becomes the mommy monster. When she's frustrated with her kids, she becomes the mommy monster. And so it's a way for her to playfully get that stress out of her system so she doesn't take it out on her kids. On so that's kids. something to consider too, is it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to feel those feelings. It's just not okay necessarily to take it out on our kids or to take it out on our dogs. Yeah. That's something that we can work through cooperatively with our dogs yeah. in a way that everybody can enjoy it and then you okay. feel better and now you can bond that. again with your dog yeah so what are uh, so many <laughs> so many things in my head um <laughs> well it's interesting because so I go I go back to an incident once and I'm leading to something here but I go back to an incident when one of my pups was young and um she was pulling a little extra that day and we've worked very hard on loose leash walking and, and having them close to us. But this day she was pulling and I was sort of frustrated. And then I stopped. So I just, I find for me, when I get frustrated, I just stop. I ask the dog to sit down just for a moment and just, let's just. Stop. I need time. <laughs> just stop. And I went, I went into myself and I thought, because of my work with the horses, we always go back to ourselves. And. I, I realized the mood I was in that day and I thought I wouldn't want to walk with me today I understand why you don't want to walk with me today and you're pulling away I understand you're trying to make space we went home yes we have done what she had to done we went home and I realized it was it was the energy I was putting out so it's yeah it's that okay we don't need to walk you, you you don't want to walk with me. I don't want to walk with me. So <laughs> uh, it, it's that realizing. And like you say, that that stress is releasing, you know, sometimes it's just put it away, just go away. Like, yeah. Separate. Yeah. Just let it go. It's okay. Yeah. Your dog's not going to die if they miss their walk that day. Honestly, many dogs can't do walks. Mm -hmm. at least not for a while, not with the combination of owner stress dog stress triggers all around sometimes you gotta play in the backyard you know there's other alternatives to bonding with your dog and getting your dog exercise it's okay to skip the walk yeah. and it's okay to yeah look inside yourself and recognize i'm not i'm not in a place to do this and i'd rather sure. just skip it than take it out on my dog absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah let go of some of those expectations. And that's, again, I think we often put as dog owners, put so many expectations on ourselves. And, you know, we have this idea in our head of having this, you know, almost robotic, obedient dog next to us that's, that's going to do all the things because we think that's what people are expecting. And we think that we're socially, you know, we're, we feel embarrassed or we feel um, pressure in some way to have our dog behaving a certain way and you know dogs are just again just like kids if your toddler's on a walk with you and they're doing behaving a certain way they're it's a toddler mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. <laughs> if our dog's on a walk and behaving a certain way it's a dog as long as nobody's in danger yeah do what you can with what you got and exactly. just most important thing is that bond and being there for your dog because that's what's over time going to help them feel safe and going to start seeing 
changes in those emotional behaviors, those big emotional behaviors. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're seeing it as we're seeing it as a changing that to um, seen as behavior, not as a result of a training as a, com- a, re- a result of a command. We're yes. looking at them. You have yeah. behaviors all the time. My both both of mine are behaving sound asleep in their beds right now. Like it's, it's, it's <laughs> yes. there's different behaviors <laughs> at different times. Um, so let in your, your research and in your learning, um, I know you talked about it, somebody that was talked that, that learned about the seven different sort of needs. Um, can you talk yeah. about that? Especially I'd like to go into the seeking one because that's yes. really absolutely high end. Yeah. So Dr. Yak Ponksep was the first. He's kind of the father of effective neuroscience, which is what the effective dog behavior is kind of named after. Effective for emotion, right? It's not effective, it's affective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so effective neuroscience is kind of the the area that he founded with his research. And what he did is he d- dove deep into the brain, did some stimulation deep in the brain. Um, to find out where each emotions kind of where's the pathway right it darts from here to here here from here right so he identified seven separate pathways in the brain and he labeled those by based on kind of the emotions that seem to be stimulated by those pathways so the big one is the seeking system yeah the seeking system is all-encompassing and we are always seeking I think the only time he found that seeking is kind of turned off is during eating, because if you're still seeking when you're eating, you're going to stop eating because you're going to be motivated to go find something else. So you got to that's that system kind of has to slow down a little bit while you're eating. So you'll actually stay eating. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But otherwise, the seeking system's always active in an effort to keep us in homeostasis. Right. And keep needs met because we've always got needs in one way or the other right there's Mm -hmm. either emotional needs physical needs there's kind of always something that our brain needs to seek after to keep us at homeostasis Mm -hmm. so the seeking system's kind of all-encompassing and i have a a great graphic from the effective dog behavior from scott that kind of shows how these systems interact with each other but kind of up above in this bubble the seeking bubble which connects everything you have the social um, emotions which are play Mm -hmm. um, care Panic, grief. I know that sounds weird that that's social, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Panic, grief, and lust, of course, right? So these are your social, um, emotional systems. And, you know, lust is obvious. Play is pretty obvious. Play is is an innate need. So it's actual system in the brain. And when I say play, it's free play, right? It's not structured play with rules like kickball you know it's free play where kids get to wrestle and laugh and make things up as they go i think of calvin ball with calvin and hobbs i don't know if you if you remember calvin and hobbs but Mm -hmm. there was no rules they just winged it they made up rules as they went right so free play Uh uh-huh yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. kira i imagine that would really fall under that where it's that i'm 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 engaging in the world right i'm engaging with the world i'm engaging socially and it has so many functions but that's that's one of the main systems and then care and panic grief are an interesting pair because they they play off each other Mm -hmm. and that's how it's those systems that are um what keep us social so think of it this way you see somebody who's in panic grief Mm -hmm. you want to care for them yeah. And vice versa, when they see you in panic grief, they want to care for you. So that's mm. the system that keeps us social. That's the system that oh, okay. gets us to care for our young or to care for our partner. Um, that care panic grief. And panic grief is what most dogs are going through when they're having big behaviors. We like to talk a lot about fear, mm. but fear comes after panic grief. So if the panic grief and they don't get care, because there's nobody available for them to get the care that they need, okay. then they might drop down to the unsocial systems, which are fear and and rage. Okay. And fear, of course, is get away from it. Rage is attack. But that happens usually when the panic grief doesn't get resolved and they feel mm. unsafe. Panic grief is I feel safe or I have a person I feel safe with. I know who I can turn to. And so panic grief would be a seeking care, seeking somebody to care for me. Fear is seeking to get out of there. You're not even seeking to go somewhere specific because that would be more panic grief. Fear is just get me away from this thing. And rage is, of of course, get this thing to get away from me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. (laughs) So, So that's the panic grief and care are what we focus on a lot. Because like I say, if you catch it early enough, 
then that's mm -hmm. that's where that relationship is happening. I'll care for you when you're upset. You'll care for me when I'm upset. And we have that back and forth. And that's how we stay social. Hmm. So can we hold there for a second? I'm just thinking back. Sure. And again, I'm going to use my uh, setting boundaries. So mm -hmm. yes, dogs set boundaries. But we see that as, as them being vicious. Right. So where do we find that balance? So uh, like you say, it's, it's catching it when it be, it's in that sort of panic. So I'm thinking to one of mine who likes to set a boundary, likes, likes her space around mom. And if another dog comes in it and she's not sure about the other dog, she'll do what I call the velociraptor is she'll sort of be like, like this towards. So she's not, she's not being, I know she's not being vicious. Another one, right. might, somebody else might see it and say she is, but I know, I know her that she's not, but she's setting this, you've come too far. I'm setting this boundary by my body, but you still come too far and you choose to come in, you know, and that's usually you're not paying I... attention to my earlier signals. So I'm having to be bigger with my signals, right? Exactly. And that's yeah. usually the point where I go, come on in, I'll protect you because I don't, because I, I don't want her to get, to take it to the next level. Yes. I don't want her yes. to, be, to learn, not learn, but it, like to, it have to no, experience I, yeah. that next level because it's not she's going to get hurt sometimes she's tiny she's yeah you know, she's she's not a lot of dog there so if she chooses to do that with a bigger dog There's i'd rather problems. yeah well <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's like where do we learn about their boundaries versus especially dogs that have maybe been on the streets that have had yeah. to create these big boundaries yeah absolutely so, yeah how do we, like can we talk just about like that is what's yeah. and i love that you brought that up because that's one thing that you know we talk sometimes about like responsive parenting and stuff like that and some people have the impression that well by by being a positive parent or responsive parent it means that you're always catering to catering to your kid and whatever no you're what you're doing ideally with your dog too is both expressing and respecting healthy boundaries it's like any other relationship. We both have boundaries. You don't necessarily need to punish your dog necessarily, but you can have a boundary with your dog and say, you know what? Not right now. I'm not, I can't do that right now. You're going to have to wait. And that's okay. It's okay to say no, Yeah. but you can do it in a nice way, in a respectful way. And eventually your dog will kind of get it that now is not the time. Um, but in that situation, yeah, our dogs are absolutely also communicating boundaries. And when we look at it that way as boundaries, instead of aggression or, or disrespect or dominance or anything like that, mm -hmm. then we could start having that perspective with, if I had this boundary, how would I feel? Like, how would I feel if somebody was pushing this boundary? Mm -hmm. Um, and what you're, the way you're responding, I love that you described how you're responding because that is care. That is a version of care. Care isn't just petting mm -hmm. and not even just play care is, oh, I noticed you're thirsty. Here's some water yeah. care is, oh, I noticed you're feeling uncomfortable. Let me take over this situation, right? Let me get between you and the uncomfortable thing. Care is noticing the need and meeting it, mm -hmm. whatever that need is. And in her case, the need is I need cuddles from mom. I'm my opioids are super low, right? Mm. I need these cuddles. My brain thinks I'm in danger if I don't get these cuddles, which is a weird thing to think about. But when the mm. opioids are that low, the brain does think it's in danger. That's again, how it stays social. It if it didn't think low opioids was dangerous, it wouldn't seek after opioids, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're addicted to those opioids because that's what keeps us social. And so when those get too low and they come to seek you to raise them up again, they're mm. in a very vulnerable state. And on top of that, she's getting their heightened oxytocin because she's in your present. And that's what's giving her the courage to defend herself yeah. while she gets that need met. And mm. you saying, yeah, she needs this and meeting her need and keeping the other dogs away is exactly what's needed in that moment. A lot of times our automatic response is bad dog. Don't don't get aggressive. Right. Bad dog. Don't do that. Mm. Let him you know, he's not doing anything wrong. Right. And we tend to pressure the dog into accepting another dog into their presence and i think as a human being if i were on a bus right and yeah. someone were getting into my space and i was uncomfortable with it yeah i have to put up with it but i'm not gonna like that i'm not gonna feel comfortable with that but if i'm yeah. in a situation where i have a right to more space 
right? Sure. And somebody is purposefully invading my space, even though they have all the space in the world to use, yeah. Yeah. then now I'm going to start getting, I'm going to start saying on. something, right? Yeah. 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 I'm going to start saying something. It's like, why can't you sit over there instead of leaning into me right here? Yeah. Um. So when we give ourselves the, the kind of that perspective of that is a need, that's, that's her. She's low on opioids. Her brain thinks that's an emergency. And so she thinks she's helping herself and somebody is getting in the way of that. Somebody's threatening that by not just getting in her space, but potentially taking your attention, right? In a way it is resource guarding, but I don't like to put it that way because again, that makes it sound very aggressive. It's she needs you and someone else is trying to take you from her when she needs you to build up those opioids and raise those warm, fuzzy, safe feelings in her body. So but is by she you, also, sorry, Claire. no, you're okay. Go ahead. Well, is she, well, I guess we're not in their brains, but it's, is she just saying you're too close to me? Is she protecting her own body? Uh, it could be. Absolutely. Um, I see it a lot where it's a situation where the dog is kind of, they're defending the space. They're defending the act, I guess. Right. They okay. don't want you to stop touching and holding them if the other dog comes close, right? And if the other dog is kind of pushing her away or getting into the space and potentially going to take your attention away from her, okay. she it's a connection. I, I hate to say attention. It's connection. She's mm -hmm. worried she's going to get disconnected from you. Oh, I, usually I is what I, I see. Yeah. And obviously having not seen the specific situation, yeah. um, if she feels in danger, physical danger, if she's small enough like that, yeah. then absolutely it could be, I'm worried you're going to step on me. I'm worried. I'm physically, I feel unsafe because you're too close to me. So that can absolutely also be the situation. I just see it a lot where dogs seem defensive when they're in mom or dad's lap and people oh, go, oh, she's yeah, guarding me. In a yeah. way, that is what it is. But what she's guarding is she's guarding that connection that she needs in that moment. Uh, it's yeah. kind of like if she had a water dish and she's dying of thirst and some dog approaches the water dish, For right? Sure. Or a food dish, a dog that resources guards food. If they're starving to death and there's food right there and another dog's coming close, gonna, they're going to yeah. guard that food because they're starving and they need it. When those opioids are low, the brain mm -hmm. literally thinks it's starving of opioids and it thinks it sees yeah. it as a threat. Uh, and okay. so she is trying to defend that connection yeah. or she might be defending her physical safety as I well think that's you know we're better than i do because she's a distance away it's not she's not mm -hmm. on my lap it's a distance away and it's only okay. when a dog that is just a little more confident maybe different you know, yes hormones, but um different chemicals but it's just when a dog is a little bit up and a little Forward. bit more <laughs> than she can handle then she's like, yes, push. It's okay. Like pushing that. No, I can't handle this. So I'm going to push it away to be, it, it yes. feels like I want to be ahead confident. of time. Yeah. Yes. I want to be confident. Yeah, she's ahead of, she's pre pre defending herself, right? Before <laughs> it becomes even a risk that she, that's her level of comfort, right? You're that far away. If you get any closer, I start feeling like I am in physical danger. And with her, like you say, with her being as little as she is, there could very well be <laughs> very yeah. awareness of you are too rambunctious that I feel but unsafe with how, yeah, but how big themselves. you are yeah, behaviorally. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And you know, that's it's, and I will say that that is technically still the rage system. Sure. Yeah. It's a combination. They can be in multiple systems at once. Right. So there's the panic grief care would help with that. Just, uh, yeah. You know, the way you respond is great. Rage is frustration. Rage is um, disappointment. Like anything that causes sure. us to uh, like have that feeling that is rage. Rage is a big word. You know, it yeah. sounds scary, but rage includes anything that's like anger, frustration, anything like that. So if she's reacting in a way to scare them off or to make them go away, that is technically rage, but she also probably has panic grief right now. Rage is dominant, yeah. but as soon as you show that you're going to care for her, her panic grief is going to become dominant. And then she's going to turn to you and get comfort and safety from you. Okay. So she's going to move between systems. She's going to kind of have two systems yeah. at the same time. Um, and so those kinds of responses are rage responses because it's trying to make the thing go away. But She's open. I'm sure she's open to getting that care. She's. I'm oh, sure she's still got that panic back. grief I, system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's. Yeah. All, I'm sure she's also looking for mom as well. So. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. It's. Yeah. It's a really interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting. It's nice to have like a system to look at like that to be able to say, oh yeah, okay, my dog right now is, you know, feeling this way. 
care is how, you know, care mm -hmm. will help, right? Um, we want to, as soon as care, or as soon as a connection shows that it's available, that's what brings them up out of the fear, fear rage, right? Yeah. As soon as they see safety, that brings them up from the fear rage. And then they move into the panic grief, and then they can be cared for, and then they can get into a more, you know, play or, um, you know, or they'll care back, right? So you'll get them back into a system that, that's, is more social. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Interesting. if you notice your dog's in rage or in fear, then care showing then, that you're available yeah. to them in that moment will bring them up to panic grief so that they'll seek you for care. And then in the future, we want to get them into the habit of, oh, in this situation, I can turn to mom and dad. I can turn to my safe person. Yeah. And instead of I need to defend myself. So well yeah, they're always going to get I mean we always think say to the, about the horses even is that the, the, it always escalates. You're never going to get a zero to 10. You're going to get a yeah. zero. You're going to get a, a four. Five, you're going to get a seven. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get a 10. And it's us being aware and creating that connection at a four. Yes, exactly. That's Noticing as soon as we can so that we can step in and show that they have a safe place so that they can stay social and get the, get the need met. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And are yeah, these, the but, sooner we notice, the better. <laughs> are these because they're, you know, they're wild animals. Like the, there's that wild tendency in them. Are these needs that would have been met by mom? Yes, mom, and you know, social groups, even and even groups, animals. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and even animals that um, don't have social groups typically still have these systems because they needed them to breed and they needed them to care for babies yeah. so they've actually found this, this exact same system in a huge number of animals um the the assumption would be that if they do anything social even if if it's breeding if it's ha you know caring for babies caring for young then they're going to have these systems there's a little bit of iffy like maybe a sea turtle you know since yeah, they the just lay their eggs and leave yeah, yeah. they may or may not but what we found there, there's been research that even snakes right really? have have the need to be cared for and to be touched and to mm -hmm. you know have certain um similar needs uh Talking so it's here. not just a mammalian oh. thing necessarily you're seeing wow. it in birds you're seeing it at reptiles um so yeah it's a pretty it's a fairly universal system if they have any need to be social for any reason then they're probably going to have all of these seven systems and they've done research on a number of different animals i don't think they've done research on dogs um mm, which is really? kind of sad because it would have been nice to have direct that like would be, yeah. here's the research yeah. but if it applies to so many different animals i feel like it's not a huge leap to to, to jump and say that this is probably applicable to dogs, especially since we have applied it to people and sure. people and dogs are living together and, you know, very enmeshed in our, our way of, of life and our social systems. So it's the reason we get along so well, because we care for each other and we, you know, notice yeah. each other's panic grief and care for each other. So interesting. So what I've noticed our time here suddenly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what can help us? I want to finish with the question and I'll give you the floor for a bit is what helps us most in our relationship and connection with our dogs? What can we do in that to build that? Um, goodness. <laughs> being, I mean, we've talked about being in the moment, being present, right? I think if we do that, if we remind ourselves to do that throughout the day, then that will make a huge difference in in a lot of behavior problems that we see. Because again, a lot of them are the result of us being busy, us not reading body language because we're completely two completely different species um it's hard enough when you've got a partner to always meet their needs perfectly correctly right and then mm. we've got this completely different species whose needs and communication are so you know a little bit different from ours so i think being present making ourselves just be present with our dog for 20 minutes here and there 10 minutes five minutes whatever just so we can make sure hey buddy you doing okay right now what can i do right what what can i do for you in this moment that will top you up so that you can handle another you know two hours or whatever mm -hmm. um, when you have dogs that are reactive at the door people coming sure. to the door for example if you you know an hour before that made sure they were all topped up on all their needs and made sure their opioids were high and mm. you know they didn't have any stress in their system you play the stress away then now when that person comes to the door you're gonna have a much smaller reaction because they didn't go five hours uh, waiting right. to be noticed or you know yeah. having to try and meet the needs by themselves so um being present being yeah. taking that opportunity throughout the day to just i'm gonna just 
forget about everything else and just focus in on my dog Mm -hmm. for a little bit right now and just take some time throughout the day to do that. Um, I think would make a difference and, you know, letting go of expectations sometimes, you know, we sometimes for ourselves and for our dogs have such high expectations for we're constantly looking for, is this something I should reward? Is this something I should make go away? And let's just enjoy our dogs and just let go of those expectations um, for a while and not constantly be in that training mindset, but just let go of the training mindset, you know, regularly so that we can just enjoy our job dogs um, in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But in the end you get a, 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 I guess a reward in the training because you've created that relationship and connection. So absolutely. It, Cause it, that it, relationship it, will be a great foundation and they will be way more attentive to you and uh, yeah. willing to follow through and listen and do those things because they're, Hey, you've been meeting my needs, whatever this is, I'll do it. Cause you've yeah. been, I feel good. You've been taking care of me. Yeah. I feel good. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'll do this thing that you're asking me to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that connection. And I mean, I go out and walks and I talk to the dogs and it's like, it's like, I'm sure people are like, who's she talking to? I'm I'm talking to my dogs. Like we're having a, but there's a connection and they're trotting along beside looking up going, yep, yep. We're having this. And it becomes a walk together. Not, oh, oh, I have to walk the dog. Yes. It's not, I'm just walking the dog. I am going on a walk with the dog, right? It's a completely different mindset of I am doing a thing and enjoyable activity with my dog, which means we both get to do fun things. It's not all about what they want to do. It's not all about what I want to do. We're doing the things we love together, which means even if he's rolling in something smelly or he's sniffing something gross i'll be like oh looks like you found something something disgusting good job we're gonna like, get a bath laughter <laughs> we'll, yeah we'll we'll go do something afterward to take care of that but for now let's let you enjoy your time so yeah, exactly yeah i love it well and getting letting go of those social norms those social that social pressure that we yes. put on ourselves i think there's a lot problems. more yeah i think we exaggerate in our heads a little bit more what's actually expected you know we have in our head that people are are judging us a lot more than maybe they are especially since the people that are doing the judging have a lot louder voices sometimes (laughs) there's fewer of them but they're a lot more vocal so yeah yeah, yeah. it's okay to let go of those expectations and to just let your relationship with your dog take priority i love that i love that and that's uh really why why we we did this is just to just to have you know that we can build that connection we can build that relationship and and it's wonderful when we do and it makes us feel it helps our dogs but it makes us feel really good too exactly yeah that's the whole point of a relationship right it's a back and forth it's not just about all your dog it's not all you it's give and take between the two of you and the great thing is is that you see behavior improvement in the process right it's not just oh let your dog do whatever he wants but you know if your goal is improving behavior it's okay to let go of that goal but to say you know what i'm gonna pay attention to my dog and look at meeting his needs and hopefully these behaviors will improve and what you'll you'll, what you'll notice is that they will of course we don't want to have the goal of changing the people we love but when we care for them we often see we we feel when we feel good we do good is that how that quote yeah, goes yeah, when you yeah. feel good you do good because when we feel connected and and loved and accepted and heard and you know have our needs met and all those things happen then we don't have the big scary feelings that make us behave in big scary ways exactly because all those needs get met so exactly it's yeah. it's a side effect we don't have to make it our necessarily our full goal but it's our side effect to exactly to having a a great connections so. Exactly. so we're almost done here so i'd love to give you a few moments tell us about your your what you do and your beyond behavior and just tell us a little bit about how about that absolutely yeah so i'm like i said i'm in davis county utah um i don't call myself a trainer because i don't really work with again i don't my goal isn't consequences my goal isn't necessarily behavior change as directly but my goal is my Scott Stouffer calls himself a canine life coach. So it's kind of a life coaching or a therapy, mental health, you know, we're looking at how can we in a holistic way, um, 
improve the communication and the connection so that the behaviors go away on their own. We don't have to teach the dog to stop those behaviors. Those behaviors will fix themselves when the emotions get resolved, right? When the safety um, gets improved, when the connection gets improved. So I kind of help people recognize and learn what is being communicated by that behavior, what emotions are behind that behavior, and how they can act in a way that improves the dog's well-being in that moment. Of course, every dog owner is doing everything they can to love their dogs. And sometimes there's just a disconnect, you know, a miscommunication. And so I kind of help pick apart what that disconnect is or what that miscommunication is so that we can do the things that that are actually being asked for. Because sometimes we, we with our best intentions, sometimes we offer the wrong thing and don't realize that, that that's what's happening. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's fun. I love the people. Oh, I, I love the dogs. So mm -hmm. it's a fun, fun awesome. process. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. Yeah. Thank so you, Linda. I truly appreciate to, it. Uh, to chat and share. If you had one piece of wisdom or suggestion for an action today um, for folks with dogs, what would it be? Oh, <sighs> Go do one yeah, thing with your dog today. What would that be? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would play with your dog, but let your dog lead the play. Okay. So don't go above their energy level. Don't don't hype them up, but let them lead the play. If they're taking the ball and they're running away from you, instead of getting frustrated that you can't grab the ball to throw it, take that communication that I want to play keep away. And go chase him. Go poke his butt. Go, I gotcha. And then make him chase you. Like, okay. let him guide the play. If he's, he'll probably eventually drop the ball for you again. You can throw it. But then if he plays keep away again, well, just go with it. Um, right? So that's that's one of my favorite things is adjust your play. So instead of having this idea of this is how play needs to go, be fluid with your play with your dog. And let them let that. them show you what they want to do mo moment to moment. Yeah. And oh, loosen that. up and that. have some fun with them. Oh, we're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I look down. She's right here. <laughs> she's I love like, that. Yeah, love mom. <laughs> yeah, you mean I don't have to drop it right now? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. I will put all of your uh, contact information and some of the stuff we've talked about today and the people we've talked about um, on our summary so that uh, folks can uh, certainly get in touch if they wish to and have Beautiful. a look at the things that that we um we have we you've done like that's this uh, beautiful i love it i love it um and thank you those that are listening watching this or listening in the future um we are so glad that you've joined us in circle today and um thank you for being with inspire me forward as always we ask that you share it forward if there's anybody else that you think of those how many million people that have dogs in their households if you think any of them might uh, need to hear this or want to hear this please do share it forward uh, that's how our circle, that's how our circle grows. So thank you for being inspiring, Alicia. And I look forward to staying connected and um, keeping a relationship with my dogs like I have. Thank, thank you. you, Linda. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.